Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. My name is Subhu Iyer, CEO of Aerospike. And in the next hour, I'm going to be joined by a few folks here. And I'll introduce them to you to really talk about you know, what Aerospike AWS makes possible for all of you, right? for our customers, our partners. So we're competing with a Kubernetes session somewhere here at 245. So I was actually thinking of adding, building Kubernetes-based real-time applications with Aerospike to the title. That's a mental note for me next time around, that if I add K8S, the room will be packed, <laughs> right? So anyways, thanks for joining. Thanks for your time. Um, as I said, um, three folks uh, are going to join me on stage here, and Raj will be the first one. Raj leads all products for EC2 uh, at AWS. Uh, so he'll come and talk about really the wonderful partnership that Aerospike and AWS has built over the last several years. Then Tal from Wix, uh, Wix.com is going to talk about a great journey that they took with Aerospike and you know, what, what were the results that they got as a result of really moving to Aerospike. So we'll hear a great story. Uh, and then to cap it off, Kyle from Fidelity Investments will come and talk about you know, how, how they leverage Aerospike with Snowflake to run advanced analytics. So it's a pretty kind of a diverse set of presentations. But before we get started, I just want to set the context around you know, why, why are you all here? Why does Aerospike even exist? Why is AWS working with Aerospike and Aerospike you know, so happy to work with AWS? So if we go back and look at what's happening in the market out there, data is growing, we all know that, right? Whether it's 175 zettabytes or 200 zettabytes, you know, let's stop counting. What's important is the growth of real-time data. So if you look at this chart, real-time data is growing faster than actual overall data growth. To the point where in the next three years, real-time data will be 30 plus percent of all data that is created. And so why, why is that? Why is that the case? It's because we as customers expect instant results. Right? We expect B2B, B2C experiences in the B2B world. If I can turn my phone on, call an Uber or a Lyft, and it shows up, hopefully, in, in a minute or two, then why can't you know, B2B services actually be instantaneous? Number one, so customer experience, customer drive, customer engagement is a strong factor for all organizations to leverage and build services on real time, real time data and real time applications. On the other side of that, is really the growth of real-time data. More data propels better decisions, better insight. You know, we, we know all of that. So, but how do you manage this conundrum? When you look at purely from a business perspective, you know, here are some kind of numbers here to show that data-driven organizations, especially organizations with leverage and are building new services around real-time, are more successful. So not just data, but leveraging real-time data to build newer services, you know, newer applications, so on and so forth. So you can see here reduction in capex, time to market, of course, and increased customer acquisition. Again, as I said, customers are driving organizations to do this. Competitors are driving other organizations to kind of set up similar services or more differentiated services leveraging real-time data. To the point where in a few years, I think there'll be companies which are really, really good at jumping on this bandwagon early on, and they'll be the others. So the winners basically will be the ones who are already working to stand up real-time database applications. But we see a significant challenge in terms of current architectures, right? And this happens in our industry, you know, every decade or so, where a new platform a new technology comes into play, and it basically dates you know, what, what we were using or what we had put in place. When AWS launched you know, in 2007, which is a small little service, it was a game changer. We know that. It's only been 15 years. But just think about how radical a shift that's been. 
And I use this example all the time. 2007 was the first iPhone launch, too. So you had a new client and a new server paradigm defining the next evolution of the technology industry. Okay? And that is why current approaches, current architectures you see there are not able to leverage real-time data. Your infrastructure, your architecture that you put in place will not meet the needs of what you want to be if you're trying to build real-time applications leveraging real-time data. So Gartner has you know, what it calls its critical capabilities. I, I don't know if you guys you know, look into Gartner along with the MQ, they talk about critical capabilities of any new market or new category. So here's our attempt of what we feel are requirements to really tap into and build a real-time data infrastructure. We believe, first, the platform needs the ability to process and ingest data at really high speeds, really, really high speeds, and be able to actually make decisions or drive decisions in milliseconds to seconds, if you will. The second piece is, if you're launching a real-time app, it better be highly available. It cannot go down, right? It has to be available all the time, 24-7, 365. Because that's the expectation, again, from a customer perspective, that these services and these applications are always available. The third point is strong consistency. And you know, you, you'll not hear this mentioned by a lot of the other vendors in the NoSQL market uh, because strong consistency usually have a, has a compromise in terms of degraded performance. That means if you go for eventual consistency, you basically have the chance to have stale data or dirty reads, as we have called it in the industry for decades. When you're working with real-time data, you cannot afford to have data that is stale because the decisions are being made on an instance, so you need current versions of data all the time. The next piece is any real-time data platform that you put in place cannot be a silo, right? It has to be part of your, you know, call it the modern data infrastructure or the real-time data infrastructure. So it has to integrate with your streaming engines, with your analytics, you know, Sparks jobs or whatever that might be in your data pipelining or AI ML pipelining. So it has to be easily integratable, if you will, to the overall pipelines. It has to be massively scalable, because we see this invariably with customers. They start their journey with a certain amount of scale, and what they realize is that on the data dimension of scale, if they leverage more data, they're actually better in terms of the service and the insight that they're able to offer. But scale doesn't really mean only data. It could be throughput. It could be the number of concurrent users, right? Ironically, if your service or your app becomes very popular, you'll get more users on it. And if you get more users and more concurrent users on it, and if the platform starts not performing, then you have an issue. As we know, replatforming is the most expensive thing that you, you know, have to go through in the software world. So you want to be able to avoid that. And the last piece is, the ability to deliver predictable performance across any dimension of scale. If it's data, you may start at gigabytes, you may go to terabytes, you may go to hundreds of terabytes, you may potentially go to a petabyte data set. You may go with thousands of users, leading up to potentially millions of users concurrently as your service becomes very, very popular. Can the platform deliver predictable performance and keep up with you? keep up with your growth, keep up with your aspirations. So we believe these six attributes are absolutely required for any real-time data platform. And this is what we kind of built into Aerospike. So the next slide is, is really a build slide, which is talking about the Aerospike real-time data platform. And at the core is our database. So the most current version of our database is 6.2, which we just released. Uh, which, which is really reflected here as Aerospike Database 6. Aerospike started his journey as a high-performance key-value store. We've added support for documents earlier this year. 
We've added support for the ability to use SQL and run SQL queries on the data that is sitting in Aerospike. We've announced beta availability of our graph solution, and we'll be releasing our graph solution early next year in GA. And then shortly after, we'll also have a time series data model supported. The idea here is that we want to be giving you all the power to work with any kind of data model for a specific use case on Aerospike. Okay? The way you actually build applications on that, as you'd expect, is using your most popular uh, programming languages or APIs. You can run them on AWS, obviously. You can run them on other clouds, or you can also run them, you know, again, uh, bare metal or on Kubernetes, right? <laughs> so we, we support all of that. But we didn't leave it there. Again, as I talked about, this doesn't live in a silo. So we built a connector family of products. So we have connectors into the most popular streaming engines out there. And what that does is lets the world of data streaming meet the world of data persistence. So you may be using whatever your most popular choice is for streaming, but you want to be able to ingest that at really high speeds and store that data for persistence in Aerospike. And with our connectors, you can do that. On the other side, we've also built connectors into Spark and Presto Trino. So, you know, when I talked about really SQL, you know, that's what SQL leverages, right? Basically, a Presto Trino connector to run SQL queries on the data that is in Aerospike. If you use Spark, you can actually use a Spark connector to run parallel, multi threaded. You know, Spark workers can go against the distributed Aerospike cluster so that you have answers in an instant. So that's basically the real-time data platform that we offer that a lot of you probably hear and other customers are leveraging. The end result is what you get out of Aerospike, the real-time data platform, is low cost. I had this as lowest cost. But you know the AWS Air, uh, editor team asked me to take out superlatives, so I had to change it to uh, low cost. But it's actually pretty amazing. We can reduce server footprint or instance footprint in the cloud by up to 80 percent, and I'll I'll show you a few examples, right? Vis-a-vis -vis competitive solutions, and this is not just a one customer story, you know, or you know a one instance story. This gets repeated again and again. Just think about the TCO reduction that you're able to get as a result of that. I talked about scale. We can scale as far as data is concerned from gigabytes to petabytes, from thousands of users to millions of users concurrently. Throughput also you know, is not an issue for us. Low latency, obviously, built into the platform. That's how we deliver this high performance. And the concept of always on. We have customers that are running on Aerospike on AWS for the last decade with no downtime. So let me say that again. 10 years, no downtime, Aerospike on AWS. And we do that supporting strong consistency, predictable performance, and all the other attributes that I talked about. Right? Really difficult to accomplish this. I'm going to share a couple of examples here of customers. Dream 11. If, if you've not heard of Dream 11, it's the world's largest online fantasy sports platform. 110 million plus users registered on the platform, and they support basically, you know, cricket, football, um, I guess football, not soccer, but football, um, hockey, baseball, in terms of really being, you know, letting players build their fantasy teams on, on the platform. They have 5.5 million concurrent users when, when a particular game is going on. 5.5 million concurrent users and 1 million transactions per second, as you can see, right? 1 million TPS, all delivered at a latency of less than 15 milliseconds. And they, they've been a customer for some time, and they've been consistently growing at north of 30% in terms of their data usage, their user growth, and so on and so forth, and they have not had to replatform. 
an amazing success story. If, if you've not heard of Dream11, just look them up. It's an amazing uh, success story of a company that's really architected for scale. I talked about costs. Here's just two examples. There's Signal and there's Platika. Signals really reduce their server count from 450 servers to 60 servers on Aerospike. At the same time, they actually increase their throughput and decrease their latency by a significant factor. So you can see their throughput went up from 500K TPS to 8 million TPS and latency from you know, 3,900 milliseconds to 23 milliseconds. Platika, similarly, 200 servers to 30 servers. And this just keeps repeating again and again. So this TCO savings is real in addition to all the other value that I talked about. I'm going to pivot now a little bit to talk about really the work that we did with AWS to actually further this value proposition for you from a TCO perspective and a performance perspective. And that's really 6.2, which is the most current release of our database. We support Graviton. We just released it before reInvent. And it just pushed the envelope even further. 63% improvement in terms of price performance. You can see the benchmark that we ran. 25 million TPS and 99% of those completing in less than one millisecond. So the 63% price performance comes from 27% reduction in costs, 18% improved throughput. And as a result of all that, there's about a 50% reduction in carbon footprint. We have an IEEE blessed paper on this if you're interested in really looking at the math from a carbon footprint perspective. Um, you heard, if you heard Adam this morning, this was done on Graviton 2, but Graviton 3 gives you 20, 25% even better than Graviton 2 in terms of performance. So you think about Aerospike giving you all the TCO and the performance, Graviton 2 giving you 63% additional price performance, and then you go on Graviton 3, that's an additional 20 to 25%. It just keeps getting better. It's like compound interest, right? It's amazing. Quick, quick look into document. The reason we support documents is because a lot of our customers have large document data stores, and the current alternatives that are available in the market do not scale nor do they have the concept of high availability. So across a bunch of verticals, you know, this is something that is in great demand. Here's a few customers. Uh, ZoneTab, which is a IoT geofencing company and application that uh, really taps into you know, worker safety, you know, looked at you know, one of the more popular document databases out there, and it just couldn't scale for their requirements. Then we have a customer intelligence ad tech platform uh, that really, again, looked at another competitor and moved to us. And then Airtel, which basically built their customer 360 on, on Aerospike. And that's also a document support. My last slide here, just talking about why real-time data is actually spreading so and growing so, uh, you know, so much is because it's being used across industries. It's not just in one industry. It's in financial services. It's in e-commerce. It's in gaming and entertainment. It is in ad tech, of course. But you can see the use cases out there in some of the logos. Okay. So with that, um, I'm going to ask Raj to come up on stage and share um, you know, the, the wonderful work around Aerospike and AWS. Raj. Thank you, Subhut. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I hope you're having a very good reInvent. Good, been good so far? Yeah? Well, this is my eighth reInvent. It's my eighth year at Amazon leading products for EC2. And when I think about the most important thing that we do at Amazon, the most important part of my job, it's really working backwards from our customers to build products that innovate on their behalf. And over the last few years, we've built a really strong partnership with Aerospike in being able to do that. And I'll, I'll cover kind of how we got there and some of the specifics behind the Aerospike workload and what we've been able to achieve uh, for workloads similar to Aerospike on behalf of our, our joint customers. So when you think about what makes Aerospike unique, 
it's a real-time workload that has uh, requirements that are really stringent around latency and throughput. Aerospike real-time workloads require millions, if not billions, of transactions per second. And end customers need their data in real time. You, know, you can't wait for a real-time workload. It has to process synchronously. And when we talk about latency requirements, we're talking milliseconds, if not sub-milliseconds. So the, just the infrastructure that needs to support this is on the edge of what's commercially available. So it forces us to think about how do we push those boundaries. But it's not enough to deliver that performance. You have to deliver it cost effectively. When we talk about the amount of data that has to be processed through solutions like Aerospike, we're talking petabytes of data. And when you take petabytes of data and you process them at millions of transactions per second, it's really easy for costs to get out of hand. So how do we build infrastructure that can take millions uh, of uh, transactions per second across petabytes of data and deliver performance cost effectively? And finally, end customers of Aerospike are across the globe and they're across markets that have extremely stringent regulations around security and reliability. We're talking telco, we're talking manufacturing, we're talking financial services industries. They need their solution to be secure, they need it to be highly available, and they need it to be globally available. And they need to be able to spin it up in minutes. When Aerospike customers, when AWS customers want to spin up a workload, they don't want to wait for it. They need to be able to bring it up in whatever city, whatever country, whatever region their end customers are in. So they look to AWS to provide this infrastructure on a global scale with high availability, high reliability, and the performance and the cost that these compute intensive workloads require. So the nature of Aerospike workloads and the nature of our customer workloads are really diverse, which drives us to deliver platforms that are equally as diverse. You saw a slide like this uh, in Adam's keynote, but since this keynote, the number has gotten even higher. So he presented that we have 600 different instance types. So that, that's an improvement even in one day from what we had <laughs> yesterday. But we build our instance platforms across a number of different categories. We look at general purpose workloads, compute optimized, memory optimized, storage bound workloads, accelerated computing workloads. And we build this across a host of different processor families. We integrate with a number of different technologies, high performance networking, high performance block storage. Because it turns out that the workloads that run on AWS require purpose built infrastructure to meet their needs from a cost perspective and from a performance perspective. So when we think about how Aerospike has been able to leverage this diversity of platforms, we have to think about the journey that they had on AWS. So Aerospike began on AWS using a set of our core instance offerings, our memory optimized, our general purpose offering, uh, offerings ranging from uh, a four to one or eight to one memory to CPU ratio. These are our M's and our R instance offerings. But they quickly realized that they had more uh, extreme needs for workloads that were more data intensive. They go to using our X instances that had 16 to one and 32 to one memory to CPU ratio. But what they really found to be the true workhorse for the majority of Aerospike workloads was instances that had high performance, low latency S NVMe SSD storage, our I instances. So the i3s and the i3en instances, our IO optimized instances, became the workhorse for Aerospike. And these yielded millions of transactions per second with extremely low millisecond level latency. But we pushed those drives, and we pushed them really hard, and we actually got to the limit of what was available with commercially available SSD technology with workloads like Aerospike. So similar to the way we've done in other areas where we've kind of reached the limits of what's available, AWS decided to meet the needs of these IO optimized workloads to innovate on behalf of our customers to build our own SSDs. 
So with that, we began shipping and building and designing Nitro SSDs, which are optimized for extremely high performance, extremely high throughput, extremely low latency NVMe SSD storage. And we ship these with our i4i instances. So our i4i's offered Aerospike an opportunity to upgrade using a similar, similar platform, but extremely uh, better performing SSD drives. So Aerospike built a benchmark called the ACT, Aerospike Certification Tool. And with that, they compared the performance on an i3 versus the next generation i4i. And they saw a four times increase in performance, a 25% reduction in, in uh, customer TCO, and a 70% increase in read-write performance, just going from one generation to the next generation of I instances on EC2. And that's a really remarkable difference, just by doing one generation shift, yielding 70% increase in uh, read-write latency. So this is great, and, and there, you know, that, that is, I4 is a core workload and a core instance platform for Aerospike. But it didn't end there. We thought, what if we took these Nitro SSDs, and what if we coupled this with the innovation that we're doing on the CPU side? Now, you've heard a lot about Graviton. So as you know, Graviton delivers a significant performance increase and a significant TCO increase in terms of price performance with our Graviton 2 and Graviton 3 processors. You know, often 40% or more price performance increase. And it's significantly more efficient than the comparable architectures, offering up to 60% better uh, energy efficiency versus uh, comparative in comparable instances. So we built a set of instances built with Graviton using Nitro SSDs, all built on our Nitro system that takes the virtualization overhead that's typically done on an EC2 instance and brings it into dedicated hardware that offloads that virtualization, offloads the network virtualization, offloads the storage virtualization to give all the performance of those processors to customer workloads. So it's with that instance, with that set of instances, that we were able to see the benchmarks that Shubu just showed earlier, where we were able to get upwards of 40%. We saw a 63% price performance increase moving from an i4 to an i4G-based instance, IM4GEN or IS4GN instances built with Graviton. We saw 27% reduced cost for customers with a 50%, almost 50% carbon footprint reduction. And finally, we achieved this all with extremely high performance, 25 million TPS and an 18% performance improvement in throughput. So this is a really remarkable result with innovation at the virtualization layer, innovation at the CPU layer, innovation at the SSD storage layer, and finally innovation at the software layer with Aerospike solution we were able to bring end customers significant generation over generation performance improvement and cost improvement. So with that, I want to hand it over to some of the customers using Aerospike on AWS so they can uh, walk through what their experience is with that. So I'd like to invite Tal up to stage, who uh, works and drives engineering at Wix, one of the key uh, customers for both AWS and Aerospike. Thank you, Raj. Thank you, Raj. Oh, um, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Tal, and I'm an engineering manager at Wex.com. Um, I'm going to present, spend the next few minutes talking about how we utilize Aerospike and an architectural change that we made that was very significant for us. Um, but first, first, a little bit about who we are. So Wix is a leading platform to create, manage, and grow a digital presence. What started as a website builder in 2006 has grown into a complete platform providing our users with enterprise-grade security, performance, and a reliable infrastructure. Our North Star goal is to become the best web creation platform for any type of user and any type of business anywhere in the world. And our belief is that within the next seven years, 
50% of anything new created on the web will be built on top of Wix. A little bit about our size and numbers. So we have a total registered users of over 230 million. Um, out of those, over 6 million are premium users or paid subscriptions. We offer our services across 100 and different, 190 different countries, supporting 22 different languages, where on a monthly basis, we have over 2 million users onboarding onto our platform. Um, we are roughly 5,800 employees spread across 30 locations. All of those numbers translate into about 45 billion daily events that flow through our data platform. Now, what we're trying to solve, our user personalization service, aka profile service, is a real-time fact store. It is integrated with most of Wix's internal services, and actually recent mapping that we've done showed that over 70 development teams are integrated with that service in one way or another. It leverages complex insights computed from um, real-time user uh, behavior and BI data to drive intelligence into dynamic product-wide uh, decisions. Basically, this service is used for many different use cases, from being able to um, identify entire populations of users um, or uh, running machine learning models for uh, specific users. I'll give a couple of examples. Um, if we'd like to know all the users that became premium in 2022 have a site deemed as a stores category and have yet to sell any product, we'd like to be able to target those users, uh, either by sending them an email saying, um, FYI, users similar to you have done this, this, and that, and we're able to grow their business and start selling more. Um, or when a user logs onto Wix.com, we'd like to know who they are in real time and be able to customize their experience, show them a specific pop-up saying how they can grow their businesses um, by doing a few simple actions. Um, this is a self-service, computing over 3,500 um, facts. It serves um, 50,000 reads per minute, peaking at 5 million writes per minute. And we calculate everything for over 1.9 billion different keys. So this is where we started from. Well, it looks simple enough, um, but we are supporting um, two different flows, our batch flow and our real-time flow. Whenever a new fact is created um, or an existing one is updated, we run a backfill process. The backfill process is essentially spinning up EMRs that run Spark jobs that calculate everything related to that specific fact and bulk importing it into HBase. Um, then, when a user logs into Wix, they are deemed as active users, which makes us load their data from HBase into Redis for fast, fast updating and retrieval of the data. Um, now, this worked fine uh, for a while, but as our scale grew and our data grew with it, then we started getting concerned that maybe Redis will not be able to hold all of the different keys and the data that we are calculating in real time. So we decided to make a change. That change was that after three days of inactivity, um, we dropped data out of Redis. Um, that meant that now we had to introduce a new job, which is the snapshots that you can see here uh, in the diagram, which is a very heavy job that looked at data from yesterday calculated the delta, and for every act and every entity at Wix, and bulk imported it into HBase. But now we had a different problem. Now not all the data was available in Redis in real time. What that meant is that our internal customers came to us and said, what if I would like to test my business logic for users that are not currently active and users that are not currently logged onto Wix? So we needed to be creative, and we created a new flow, which is called the fallback flow, which essentially it means that we enable our internal customers to explicitly load data for non-active users into Redis and deem them as active users. 
which, if you followed what I said, essentially made it that we circled back into not having all the data available for our active users uh, in Redis. Now, this is meaningful. This has impact. That means that for some of the users that we have, we were not able to customize their experience. We were not able to do our jobs because their data simply wasn't available in Redis in real time, uh, which is a problem. Um, so having said all of that, we decided that we have to make a change. Um, that change is changing our entire infrastructure or our two layers, uh, HBase and Redis, and replacing them with Aerospike. This is kind of color-coded to show the different AWS services that we're using, but you can see that two major changes happened here. One, we dropped from two layers into one, and two, we could remove completely our daily snapshot, our very heavy job that we ran on a daily basis to make sure that we're consistent because we were consistent. We had just one layer um, that we calculated and all the data was available in that layer. So looking at this, you can see how impactful this was for us. Not just, and there's a slide showing all the differences in numbers, but this is also huge when it comes to code, the amount of code that we had to um, manage and support. This also means that a lot of legacy that we had with HBase and Redis now completely gone. And this means, which is the most impactful of all the changes, that all the data was available in real time for everyone. That meant that for our internal customers, if they would like to test anything, or for our actual customers who were active um, or logged in, everything was available for them in real time. So this kind of says it all. Um, this is the differences, the biggest differences that we had. So data availability in real time, major impact on the business. Uh, our response times, um, we dropped from 18 milliseconds total to uh, two to three milliseconds. And uh, when looking at cost at an annual, per, at an annual level, um, since not all the data was available, we paid a lot for getting less. So now we're looking at a cost saving of over 45% um, just by moving to Aerospike. And thus we have all the data available for less than what we paid for. Um, so this is us, this is our use case. And I'd like to pass the baton to Kyle from Fidelity Investments um, to talk about their use case. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kyle Bush, and I am an architect at Fidelity Investments. We're part of an enterprise group that works across all of our business units. Let's see if I can work the clicker. There we go. So I'm going to be talking today about our use case, primarily with Aerospike on our analytics platform. Uh, in full transparency, we've been using Aerospike at Fidelity, I think, for over four years. It's used heavily on our transactional and operational uh, systems. I'm specifically going to be talking today about our analytics, our analytics platform. There we go. Thank you. Um, and the use cases around our analytics platform. So our use cases at Fidelity around our analytics platform are shown in this diagram. We use Snowflake heavily at Fidelity. Our entire enterprise data lake across all of our business units is built on top of AWS on Snowflake. And while Snowflake is an awesome data lake, data warehouse platform, we ran into challenges serving that data in near real time, both ingesting in near real time and actually serving in near real time. <clears throat> and so our use cases with Aerospike come in a lot of different flavors, similar to Tal at Wix. We're using it for personalization. We also use it for market risk impact um, and a whole bunch of other advanced analytics applications that we couldn't serve directly out of Snowflake on AWS. And so our goal was to basically provide real-time decision support. And for those that have tried to do real-time decision support, it's very hard. Tal explained it with Wix. It's, it's complicated. There's a lot of data. And so moving to Aerospike solved a lot of those problems for us. So if I walk through the diagram from left to right, you know, like most people, we have transaction data, operational data. We have market data at Fidelity. And we also have interaction data, which is more of our near real-time data. That could be web clicks, 
chats, calls that are coming in. And we're using Aerospike for primarily two different use cases or in two different scenarios. One is we load that data into Snowflake as part of our enterprise data lake. We provide you know, prescriptive and descriptive analytics on that data, and we do all that in Snowflake. <clears throat> but we have situations where that data that we run batch analytics on needs to be served in near real time, and, and you can't do that in Snowflake. Um, you can't give millisecond response time out of Snowflake on AWS, no matter how you tune it. And so what we do is we use the data from Snowflake, the features in Snowflake, we build models of, on that data, and then we return that data back to Snowflake. And then from Snowflake, we actually load that data into Aerospike. And so that's our batch, um, our batch use case. The data is then loaded into Aerospike, and then we're put, putting data APIs on top of that to perform very low latency access to that data. As I mentioned, you can't do that in Snowflake. The second use case is we're looking at some of that interaction or near real-time data, and we're pulling that into Aerospike directly from those sources. Those could be an online feature store. They could be uh, near real-time. You know, we use Kafka as well. We'll bring the data in from Kafka, bring it into Aerospike, and then we'll use that data in conjunction with our data in Snowflake to build models, run inference on those models, and then load that data back into Aerospike for which then our APIs are serving that data to all of our applications. Um, and so the end goal for Aerospike for us is not just the near real-time ingestion, but basically a low latency data store that sits on top of our enterprise analytics platform. Sorry, I'll try to keep this up to my, it's hard to put like right at my mouth here. Um, so from an infrastructure topology perspective, how we use Aerospike, it's actually really simple. Most of our, um, implementations of Aerospike look like this. We've typically got a three node cluster. We're using the I3ENs right now. We will be looking at Graviton um, after hearing all the awesome specs that we heard today. Uh, those typically are one node in each availability zone so that inside the region we have resiliency. And then we do multi-region deployments. So we've got active, active deployments inside of those, um, each of those VPCs and we're doing active, active with replication between those two. We're primarily using the, the, the primary as a primary and the secondary for DR. Uh, most of our application reads um, are served from our primary. The nodes themselves, I mentioned, we're using I3N, wicked fast. Um, we don't have 250 million transactions per second, but the, I mean, I've seen some crazy numbers. I've been doing this a long time, and to see numbers like 300 microseconds under a half a millisecond over 30, 40, 50,000 concurrent API requests is crazy. Um, it's really, really fast, um, and that's what we love about it. We use a two times replication factor, and then we are using the device storage engine. Um, as mentioned, there's a lot of different storage engine classes. We primarily are using device storage, which means the data is on SSD and the memories, uh, the indexes are in memory. As far as data ingestion goes, so when we have our data in Snowflake and we're loading that into Aerospike, um, I actually wrote a utility to do that. It's a very simple utility written in Java 11 with the client libraries, the Subu mentioned, uh, that sit on top of Aerospike. Very easy to work with. Um, and it's a configuration-driven design so that pretty much any, um, any use case we have, it's basically taking a SQL statement out of Snowflake. It's inspecting that SQL statement breaking up across multiple threads, and then dynamically mapping the data types in Snowflake to the data types in Aerospike, primarily as a key value store. And there's a multi-threaded design, so we have a, a lot of throughput. So when we first looked at our first use case in, in, back in January, I think we had six or 700 gigabytes, almost a terabyte of data, and we were able to load that in a very short amount of time with one EC2 instance writing to our cluster uh, with this utility. So. Um, if anyone has questions about that, I'll be around afterwards. And so some of the benefits, some of the many benefits that we have with Aerospike, first of all, um, it allowed us to basically modernize our stack. So Fidelity is moving everything to the cloud, as most companies are, and it gave us the ability to modernize our stack uh, to be able to put Aerospike as our extension of our data, where, data warehouse, data lake platform on Snowflake. Also integrated very well with that platform that runs on AWS. So all of our Snowflake um, databases run on AWS already. So to integrate with that data platform was very easy with, um, with Aerospike. 
The performance, like I said, is phenomenal. Uh, the ability to do superior performance on whether it's just a read workload, a write workload, or, or a mixed workload. Um, as I mentioned, the, and, and you saw it on the, the chart, it's, it's almost unbelievable until you actually do it um, to see some of the performance that you can get just on a simple three node cluster running on EC2. Um, the other thing we really like about it is, and, and Subu mentioned this, is the different storage options and it's multi-model. Um, so today mostly we're doing key value. Uh, we will be doing some document work um, and also looking at um, coming up next year their graph offering. Um, that Aerospike's gonna be offering. And last but not least, very easy to set up. So at Fidelity, <clears throat> like a lot of large corporations, we have enterprise cloud computing and enterprise cybersecurity, and we have all these um, restrictions on how we do things inside of AWS. It includes rehydration, so at Fidelity, about every 60 days, no matter what workload you have, you have to fully rehydrate that workload if it's running on EC2 which means you basically not upgrade the OS, you just have to replace that node and put a new node back in. And for us at Fidelity, for a lot of platforms, that's hard. Like if you look at Oracle or even Postgres or MySQL databases, that's hard to do, keeping something always on, always running. And with Aerospike, it was really, really easy. And in fact, our group actually built a managed service around Aerospike to offer this to all the other business units. And for us, it was very easy to automate a rehydration process to basically pull nodes out and then put them right back in. Data automatically replicated. There was no down. I mean, we, we sat there and we did the test just waiting for something to fail, like a read that got missed or a write that got missed, and we never saw it. Um, so it made our rehydration process very simple and it allowed us to basically build a managed service around Aerospike. So that's all I have. I'll bring Subu up to wrap up, and I think we have some Q&A. Right, let's, um, let's do some quick wrap up here. So in summary, as you saw, right, what Aerospike provides is really a high performance database at scale with global high availability and strong consistency. We didn't touch a lot on global high availability, uh, but you can actually have a single cluster stretch across AZs in a region, across regions, across continents, and it works like magic with strong consistency and high performance. We talked about TCO. I had a lot of slides, a lot of customer examples around TCO. This is built into the platform for everyone to leverage and benefit from. We talked about the additional price performance benefits that you get from Graviton 2 and then from Graviton 3. We specifically focused on documents because there's a huge challenge for document databases at scale coupled with high availability. There are no other options out there when it comes to document databases that support scale and high availability. Now you have an option with Aerospike, and of course we talked about the proven global customers. So one thing we didn't touch on is we just announced earlier, um, you know, uh, two weeks back, Aerospike Cloud, which is essentially our database as a service, now available, at, we announced the early availability program. If you're interested, you can sign up. You know, there, there is a URL. You can come by our booth, 3835, see a demo. We already offer Aerospike as a managed service, but this one will be a true database as a service when it launches GA Q2 next year. Okay? So if you're interested, please stop by our booth. You can get a demo, talk to some technical folks, and understand the details. So there's a bunch of URLs here, 3835. There's a Try Now page that you can go and you know, play with the database, you can download it, you can you know, go to Developer Hub, which is essentially our, uh, uh, either that URL or developer.aerospike.com, and there's a sandbox tutorials, documentation, sample code, just for you to play and see whether this fits your use case or not.